Okay, so All I'm right. joined here by uh, Paul Kelly. We're backstage at the Triple Door in Seattle, preparation for the show. Paul, I wanted to ask you a bit about your family heritage, being Italian. I've got Italian heritage myself from northern Italy. Do you mind if I ask what region your family's from in the, in the country? My, my grandfather on my mother's side, was uh, his folks are from around near Venice, Venezia. He was raised in Buenos Aires and then moved back to Italy later. I'm more, probably more Irish than Italian, so there's it's just uh, one Italian ancestor. But um, he sang opera. He moved to Australia uh, in the early part of the 20th century and met my grandmother, who was a student of his. He was teaching singing. And uh, they started an opera company together. My mother also played, played music a lot as a child, so... We had a lot of music around the house. Definitely a lot of encouragement for you, I guess, in that sense. Yeah, well, uh, we all, I was one of eight brothers and sisters and we all had uh, compulsory piano lessons mm. starting about the age of ten. I just did a couple of years of piano and then switched to the trumpet in high school and picked up guitar later when I was about 18. And, uh, yeah, I've read a, a bit about your the history of opera and your family. In terms of, like, folk music, which is what you're... Uh, influenced by a lot in play, Italian folk music is something that people don't speak of often. And I've been wondering about Australian folk music and Italian, given that Irish folk music is pretty well known and documented. Was there anything in your household, or have you done your own explorations of anything folk music-wise from Italy? No, I don't know much about Italian folk. There was a series of records that came out a few years ago called La Canta de la Malavita, which was songs from around uh, which are songs of the bad life and they were I'm not, I think it was sort of not quite sure um, of the marketing of this record but they were sort of marketed as, a, as a, the songs that sort of um, uh, Cosa Nostra would listen to a the, the, the lot of these sort of fairly raw songs of um, revenge and honour and mm. blood that was a pretty good series but I think they were, they were sort of songs that had been around for a while but for fairly recently recorded but simply recorded. Uh, there's a couple of series of those records which I, I really liked. I also like a lot of the, you know, Italian-American uh, tradition, which is singers like Louis Prima. Uh, you know, I, I love, uh, love his music, Buena Sera. There's kind of, some people might sort of think of it as sort of cheesy Italian, um, but, uh, you know, it's, I love it. There's, um, and then there's singers like Al Martino in Spanish Eyes. Uh, he, he's the guy, so... Uh, and there's also a film called Big Night, which is one of my all-time favourite films. you know that one? No. Uh, it's got a lot of great music in it. I can't remember all the notes. Stornelling is, is, is one of the people in it. There's some beautiful music in that. And that, that's a, a very, very, very good film. Oh, thank you. I'm glad someone <laughs> listen now. Yeah. And then in terms of Australian, like I know my research, you were taught um, a song called Streets of Four Stuff by an Australian musician. That was the first song you ever played in an open mic, is that correct? Uh, Streets uh, of Forbes, yeah, it's the first song Forbes, I learned, yeah. which, um, uh, which is a, a song about the uh, Australian bush ranger, Ben Hall. It's, I think it might also be sometimes known as the Ballad of Ben Hall, but Streets of Forbes and, uh, tells us, it's a very, um, quite a succinct song for a folk song. It doesn't have that many verses, but sort of covers his, his career. Okay, and just thinking, as an Australian growing up there and being a music lover, I can't think of a lot of Australian folk songs that are common. I mean, we, we have Waltz and Matilda and, and now this song I've learnt about, but I don't know why I do a radio show and I can't think past the Easy Beats. That's the oldest music I've ever played in research. A lot of great Australian folk songs, and a lot of them, you know, they've been, sometimes they're melodies that uh, were um, taken from Irish and Scottish ballads and so on. Mm. Um, you know, Waltzy Matilda's got a couple of different tunes and, and they're fairly much based on uh, old tunes. Um, you know, Morton Bay is a, be a beautiful... I mean, it's a, a song about um, uh, the horrors of being a convict, but it's a beautiful melody. Um, mm. South Australia, around, uh, South Australia, I was born. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's, it's a pretty, pretty strong tradition. Yeah. Mm. And then bringing it to Canada here, of course we have Joni Mitchells, Neil Young, Leonard Cohen, who you've seen and admired in concert. Any other people you've picked up along the way from, from Canada that you've admired? Any songs? Well, Colin and Sylvia were talking about folk music, it's Four Strong Winds, and that uh, Canadian artists, you know, Feist and 
Ron Sexsmith. And... Hello, this is Tony Bardock of The Pointed Sticks, and you're listening to CITR 101.9 FM in Vancouver. Cold as Canada is the song of your latest record, which I'm definitely going to play on the show. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about where that comes from, uh, that song? In the song cycle, I know it's a song about mm. love, relationship, and the ups and downs. I guess this is from what I can interpret, a woman kind of going cold on a man and not knowing what to say. Yeah, it's a, it's a leave-taking song, so, and it's um, it, part of the song cycle, which is called Spring and Fall, which sort of goes through the seasons. It's definitely the winter part of the record. There's only 11 songs on the record, so it's kind of the, probably the darkest, lowest point of the record in a way. There's another pretty angry song after that, but then then finishes off with a little more of an aftermath. But I, I have, you know, we've travelled Canada a few times and we've travelled across those plains. We often seem to travel Canada in the March, and I know they've got the great expression uh, up around here, Winter comes in like a wolf and leaves like a lamb. <laughs> Sometimes we've been in the, on the wolf part, and uh, uh, I've been across the plains a couple of times driving where it's been really cold when you step outside the van. So I think somewhere in the, in the lodged in my mind that little, little phrase that I thought might come in handy one day for a song. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I, last time I saw you was Edmonton, Alberta, and it was probably a cold night. So, mm. yeah, no, you, you've experienced probably what I've experienced. So the, the new song, uh, the new album, where you've kind of gone back to basics with, with folk playing style, in terms of songwriting, habits that you developed early in your life, can you speak to, speak of those those habits of recording and observing and whether they've changed a lot over the years? Unfortunately, my habits haven't changed that, that much. You know, I'm all, I guess all writers try to break their habits, which is one of the reasons I, I like writing with other, other people, because uh, you end up with different songs than the, what you would write if you just by yourself. I, I'm, I'm pretty limited on, uh, on guitar and uh, on piano, so I tend to sort of fall into the same patterns. I don't use very complicated chords. I'm always trying to break my habits, but I, I, I don't think I get very far away from them. In any event, you, you seem incredibly observational because not only the, the, the per, deeply personal uh, and songs about relationships, but of course um, the big picture and looking at Australian culture and Indigenous rights and whatnot. I'm wondering, have you been, um, are you aware of the Idle No More movement in Canada? Idle No More? Idle No More. It's an Indigenous um, solidarity movement that's uh, picked up steam in the last just couple of months and it's, it's quite it's pivotal. There's been a, a hunger strike by one of the chiefs mm -hmm. in, in, um, as against the Conservative Harper government who's doing things like proposing an oil, oil line to go all the way from Alberta through to the, uh, to the sea through mm -hmm. native lands. I just got to wondering how much, if that made the news in Australia, because I know you're aware of Indigenous issues in Australia. It, it might have, but no, I'm not aware of it, so yeah. um, I'll have to find out more about it. And is there anything, of, like, I haven't lived in Australia for five years now, and since the apology, um, can you, do you care to comment at all on, on, on the state of um, Aboriginal relations in Australia? And it, it, It's, um, yeah, I, I'm, I don't, know, don't know how qualified I am to comment, I mean, there's... So sort of sometimes it seems like two steps forward, three steps back, but uh, mm. there's a lot of sometimes well-intentioned policy that's that's misguided. Yeah, you know, there's lots of good people working away. You know, the, the real I think that the biggest thing is making sure young Aboriginal children get a good education. That's uh, so many so many are missing out, and they they start way behind in life. And that's been the problem people have been trying to address for a long time uh, with fairly spotted results. And, uh, and thanks to you, the way that you've written some songs um, that you've at least shone the light on a bigger picture with, um, from Little Things, Big Things Grow and your collaboration with uh, Yotha Yindi, I guess that's the way you've, you've contributed to the Yeah, that was just, that's just from, I was just curious. Uh, I didn't learn much about Aboriginal history at school growing up. And that's changing a bit in schools now because I, I went to school in the, in the 60s. So certain, you know, certain, there, are, there are some very important stories uh, out there to be told, especially, especially in terms of Aboriginal resistance. There was a bit of a, a myth that was propagated that, that, that Australia was, was settled peaceably or, you know, they used to say um, the natives melted away and things like that. 
but that didn't really happen. It was a, a, a cover-up in Australian history because the government didn't want to admit that there was actually a war going on. So when I first read about all the uh, examples of indigenous resistance to the settler culture, by an author called Henry Reynolds in, uh, in the mid-80s, yeah, a really good book called The Other Side of the Frontier, that opened my eyes a lot and um, uh, just started following up stories from there.